Hello and welcome to the class of 2020, as well as family, friends, faculty, staff, alumni, and all who are tuning in to enjoy this special moment. I wanted to begin my welcome with, hey all you cool cats and kittens, but I didn't want to alienate the few people who still haven't watched Tiger King on Netflix. But then again, come on folks, you've had three months to find someone to share their password with you. But all jokes aside, I would like to reflect on the past few months leading up to this joyous occasion. Looking back, this last semester at Brooklyn College took an unfortunate turn, to say the least. For many, it was difficult to see the finish line amongst the confusion that came with the COVID-19 pandemic. Having just filed for graduation a few months ago, the prospect of successfully completing the spring semester seemed nearly impossible. Some of us became ill with the virus ourselves, and we couldn't muster the energy to get out of bed, let alone complete our assignments. Others had to take care of their loved ones while worrying about employment and struggling with bills and rent. However, class of 2020, I want to remind you that adversity and struggle are not new to us, even if they may have taken on a different shape and form. We are first generation college students who have labored to navigate the higher education system to bring pride and joy to ourselves and to our families. We are mothers and fathers who have returned to school so we can have access to greater opportunities for ourselves and for our children. We are full-time students who also work full-time to afford our New York apartments. But even with all the cards stacked up against us, we made it. We made it through the excruciating hours of organic chemistry syntheses in the sweltering New Ingersoll labs. We made it through the long hours of theater rehearsals at the Tau Center for the Performing Arts and through endless nights of waiting for files to export in the Digital Arts Lab in Boylan Hall. We even made it through the long lines for the new spicy chicken sandwich at Popeye's. So, resilient class of 2020, we made it through our undergraduate journey all the while following Brooklyn College's motto, Neil Sine Magno Labore, nothing without great effort. So with our diplomas nearly in hand, we can say that all our hard work has finally paid off. This next part might sound cliche, but I came this far without making a 2020 reference, so hear me out. We're about to embark on a new chapter, a chapter that will be written through the strength we gain through this hardship. This struggle will forge us into the leaders of tomorrow. We have learned a new way to learn, a new way to teach, and finally a new way to succeed. As we part ways from Brooklyn College, let us never forget the motto that has carried us thus far. Let us continue to work tirelessly towards our professional and personal goals so we can enjoy the fruits of our labor and inspire the next generation with our remarkable story. A story that proved we can do anything. So congratulations, class of 2020. Welcome everyone. I am pleased to introduce our 2020 keynote speaker and honorary degree recipient, Sarah Deer. Sarah Deer is an outspoken advocate for the rights of indigenous people. A member of the Muscogee Creek Nation, Deer is Chief Justice for the Prairie Island Indian Community Court of Appeals and Professor of Public Policy at the University of Kansas. Professor Deer co-authored Amnesty International's 2007 report, Maze of Injustice, which documented sexual assault and domestic violence against Native women. Her most recent book is entitled The Beginning and End of Rape, Confronting Sexual Violence in Native America. Sarah Deer has been a MacArthur Foundation Fellow, and she's also been inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame. And we at Brooklyn College are so honored to be able to present her with this award. All right, Sarah. Ms. Sarah Deer, in recognition of your outstanding contributions to human rights, and especially to the rights of Indigenous women, by the authority vested in me, by the trustees of the City University of New York, I hereby confer upon you an honorary doctor of humane letters with all the rights, privileges, and responsibilities which pertain thereto. Congratulations to you, and thank you so much for joining us in this virtual graduation celebration. Thank you so much. It is truly an honor to participate. Hames J. Machanetta Chihome Huitlet, Chem Kelquichida, 
Am Bahodichka Mado Chikages, Sajapachkis. Greetings, students, families, and distinguished guests. I opened my remarks by speaking my own language, the Muscogee language, and the translation is Hello, thank you for inviting me to stand before you to talk today. I am very pleased with this invitation. Thank you for the opportunity to provide these remarks at the beginning of your new lives as college graduates. I know that sometimes commencement speeches are intended to be super inspiring and aspirational, but we are also living in unusual times. This is a very difficult time for our country, and I know that graduating this semester means that a lot of the things you were looking forward to are no longer possible, but our sacrifices, including stay-at-home orders, are a signal that we care about one another and are willing to take action to protect those around us. I know that many of you have been hit particularly hard with losing loved ones and carrying heavy loads of work, raising children and family illnesses. But I don't want you to think of yourselves as the COVID class. I want you to think of yourselves as the class of 2020 because you've worked hard to get to this point and that should be commended without a modifier, the class of 2020. And you can accomplish great things. I want to tell you that even a small matter can turn into a large victory. Let me tell you about one rabble rouser who was the first Native woman to practice before the United States Supreme Court. Her name was Lida Conley, and she fought for her people's cemetery back in the early part of the 20th century. Lida was a citizen of the Wyandotte tribe of Kansas. When she graduated from the Kansas City School of Law in 1902, she became the first woman admitted to the Kansas bar. The Wyandotte tribe was going through some internal strife dating back to the 19th century. Some of the Wyandots took an offer to move to Oklahoma and continue their government there. Other Wyandots, like Lida's family, stayed in the Kansas City area. A Wyandotte cemetery had been established back in the mid-1800s. So a major dispute arose between the Kansas Wyandots and the Oklahoma Wyandots over this cemetery. The Oklahoma faction wanted to sell the land. It was quite valuable at that time, and it was on the same city block as the Carnegie Library, the Bruin Hotel, and the Masonic Temple. And then this little Indian cemetery right in the middle of downtown. The Department of Interior put the cemetery up for sale, which would no doubt have resulted in the destruction of the cemetery. Well, Lida and her sister became quite concerned about the sale of this land where their ancestors were buried. So they spent the next 10 years fighting the sale of the land. The first action Lida and her sisters took was to physically protect the cemetery. They erected a structure at the cemetery so they could live there around the clock and protect the burial ground. They took turns standing guard and put up a no trespassing sign around it and they stayed there 24 hours a day. Step two was to file an injunction against the Department of Interior in Kansas. But she lost that first battle and eventually appeared before the US Supreme Court where she also lost. But she was not daunted. She sought a federal legislative fix, which she ultimately won. She turned to the political process when her court battles ended. In 1903, Congress repealed the sale, the bill authorizing the sale of the cemetery. And in 1916, she was successful in getting a new federal law declaring the cemetery to be a national park. But Lida still guarded that cemetery even until the day she died. Into her late 70s, she would chase out outsiders who were trespassing on the land. She even served 10 days in jail for disturbing the peace when she was in her 70s. So today, that little cemetery still stands amidst the bustle and the hustle of downtown Kansas City, Kansas. As a native attorney myself, I have looked to Lida's story with fascination and appreciation. And while my legal career has not involved guarding a cemetery 24 hours a day, I have found that creativity is sometimes the key to finding justice. 
So I want to leave you with three important thoughts. They are important to remember as we head into even more uncertain times. First, take risks. There's going to be that one job or that one opportunity that seems a little too daunting, a little too tenuous, but that is where the most noteworthy benchmarks of your life will probably occur. Second, take care of yourself. No matter the career path that we choose, we sometimes are dealing with people who are very hurt, very angry, very confused, or very ambitious. And that energy can sometimes sustain you, but can also drain you. So find the things that make you happy and make a point of fitting them into your schedule. Third, when you identify something that makes you passionate, Don't dismiss it as a pie in the sky aspiration. Figure out a way to make it work, short term, long term, because you know it won't happen if you give up. I worked on some federal legislation that many scholars and practitioners told me would never come to fruition, but I found a group of people who wanted to fight for a change in the law. Like Lida, we didn't find success in the courts, but we did find success in Congress. Congratulations, best wishes. Thank you for inviting me to speak today and thank you for the tremendous honor of receiving this honorary doctorate from this fine institution. Congratulations, class of 2020. Mado, thank you.